Hello, and welcome to another installment of the video that you're probably not gonna be watching that I'm still making anyway because I care. Those of you who are watching this, you will be given blessings in the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> oh, let's talk about blessings. Okay, so let's specifically talk about the West essay and then we'll talk about the Amra essay. So Elizabeth West, uh, writing from the United Kingdom, right? She founded the Buddhist Christian Vedanta Network for those who practice more than one faith, right? So this is her thing to think about Buddhism and Christianity together. Um, to understand that's her perspective, that is how she will be reading uh, The Noble Eightfold Path and The Beatitudes. <clears throat> she writes then at the beginning of the essay, most Christians think they know the Beatitudes well. However, their richness can be lost because our minds are loaded with conditioned beliefs and perceptions, right? We actually I already quoted that, so I guess, anyway, you understand. So what she's trying to get us to think about is the way in which the Beatitudes are not about the great hereafter. They're about the here and now. The transformative power of the Beatitudes lies in the fact that they were written in the present tense and imply realization now. They're not promises for the future or for the afterlife. They are states of being that as Christians, we are meant to enter here and now, right? The Beatitudes uh, are a course in how to be blessed, she says, more than simply being happy. Blessed suggests a profound sense of unshakable well-being that comes from the transformed self and not the acquisition of wealth and power. She then begins to talk about the Dalai Lama and the way in which he embodies right? He embodies what she believes is the spirit of Christ. She said there's a sense of actually having met Christ when you're with him. Uh, that a member of another religion could be such an icon of Christ was a profound lesson. Here we saw, right, the people that she was joining with, one who truly lives the way Jesus lived. He who embodies Christ's teaching and values truly becomes as Christ. Whether they are members of of the institutional religion set up in his name or not, it was clear to all that his holiness lives in this state of unshakable well-being to which the Beatitudes call us. So her, right, this is important that she's trying to get us to see that living and embodying, right, this Christ-likeness is not about being a follower of Jesus or having to be a Christian, right? It's about the way that you live. So what I want to do before we go into her, the parallels that she draws between the Noble Eightfold Path and the Beatitudes is, as you'll notice on the PowerPoint, I identify the four noble truths of Buddhism. The first one is that all existence is suffering, or dukkha is the word that's used, suffering, anguish, pain, unsatisfactoriness. In other words, we are all going to experience that, every single one of us. And last week, one of the things that I mentioned about us being right now in this time um, dealing with COVID-19, right, is that it's in a lot of ways becoming an, an equalizer because all of us are susceptible to this, right? And it also points out the fact that that is a common thing in human life is, is just that we're all going to suffer. And the fact that we would expect anything other than that um, is just not being realistic, right? Obviously, we will have ups, but there are 100% going to be downs. It's not only going to be satisfactory. So the first of the Four Noble Truth is that all existence is suffering. The cause of suffering is craving. Our desire for more, the natural human tendency is to blame our difficulties on things outside of ourselves. Buddha says, actually, the root is found in the mind, right? In particular, it's our tendency to grasp at things, to desire more, to want what we don't have, right? And this incessant wanting leads us to be dissatisfied. The cessation of dukkha, number three, comes with the cessation of craving. <clears throat> In other words, right, we can make a decision to stop looking for more, right? Desiring, needing, having to have, right? We can choose mentally to not live life that way. We cannot change the things that happened to us, but we can change our responses to those things. Finally, there's a path that actually leads from suffering. And this path, right, is um, the noble eightfold path. This is a way in which we, methods in which we can change ourselves. And West would say that if you're looking at Jesus' teachings and the Buddha's teachings, the eightfold path, the noble eightfold path actually lines up with uh, the Beatitudes. And then she goes into, right, obviously talking about the ways in which 
uh, these are similar. So if you look at the Noble Eightfold Path, right, we see balanced view, so having a, a, a right view, right intention, right speech or positive speech, right action, meaning wholesome action, right, not selfish action, right livelihood, being then then um, living in a way that does not cause harm, right effort, right mindfulness, um, or awareness, right self-awareness, um, and then right samadhi, uh, which is uh, contemplation, right? That we would take time to really contemplate existence and to center ourselves. Um, it's a list then she says, to the, a means uh, to happiness, right? It's the expansion on the four noble truths again and and a way to achieve the cessation of suffering. Um, the list clearly shows that our suffering is actually self-created and that our happiness and that of others are uh, inseparable. In other words, when we're happy, others are happy. When others are happy, we're happy, right? We, we understand that the connectedness of all life and we cannot be happy, she says, at the expense of others. To understand that term right then she connects it to the understanding of sin within Christianity. Um, and this, this word hamartia in Greek means to miss the mark, right? Um, it doesn't mean that you've done something horrible and, you know, that, that you need to feel ashamed of, right? It just means that you didn't get it right. You just didn't get it right, right? And you can have another opportunity and another opportunity, another opportunity. It's like a bullseye, right? You just didn't get right into the center of the bullseye. Um, and so that's the way that she sort of lines it up with this idea of living rightly, um, that we're not fully centered in the way, um, but we're trying and we're, we're just missing it a little bit, right? So this then interpretation enables us to see sin as something uh, that actually could destroy happiness rather than it being something that mars us or makes us unlovable, right? It, it's just something that gets in the way from us being truly happy. Um, the Buddha also stressed that we cause our own suffering, that sin brings its own consequences rather than it being the punishment of God, right? Um, that, that sin itself, and this is kind of that idea of karma, right? Sin itself then causes uh, these natural consequences that could disrupt our happiness. Um, so this is something we Christians need to ponder deeply to free ourselves from the fear that that old teaching on sin has engendered, the fear of Hell then enhances the fear of death and that fear blocks us from living in this fullness of life, right? Living the kingdom of God right now. Um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama points out repeatedly that the one thing all human beings have in common is a desire to be happy and to avoid suffering, right? So uh, let's jump down. Um, interestingly, right, she talks about people not believing they're worthy to be happy um, or being unworthy um, or too sinful to be happy and often this is an unconscious view so I want you guys to actually think about that for yourself right use this essay like many of the others just to do some some critical reflection right is there a way in which you might be living feeling ashamed or like you don't deserve something um, and, and for what reason uh, let's see so let's let's skip then down to think about um, about Jesus' words. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This short sentence sums up one of the truths that is very that's at the very heart of Buddha's teaching. He pointed out that one of the main reasons we suffer is because we fight life. We cling to what we want and we push away what we don't like. If we can free ourselves from craving after worldly things, this is the first key to true happiness. It's not about whether or not we have them. It's about our attitude towards them, right? What is your attitude towards things? Um, are they preventing you from true happiness. Next we see, blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. Purity of heart follows from the poverty of spirit. Perhaps this is the beatitude we as Christians are inclined to take the least seriously, yet the Buddha taught that it's possible to eliminate suffering in this life and to live in harmony. Enlightenment then could be seen as being full of the light of the divine presence, right? Being pure in heart, right? That is being full of God, and that would be likened to enlightenment. The Buddha refused to speak about God because words can never contain this mystery. He chose rather to give people the means by which to attain this state in which they would no longer need words. Going on, blessed are the gentle, the merciful, the peacemakers. From the Buddha's teaching, it's clear that we cannot truly be any of these things 
until we have at least a small measure of poverty of spirit and purity of heart, right? That means humility. Um, the Buddha spoke of four immeasurable qualities, divine abidings, loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. These qualities grow out of letting go of ourselves and then turning towards the truth, capital T, and turning towards the divine. We cannot love and care for others until we glimpse who we truly are, right? That we ourselves um, are, are love. Um, that, that we, uh, yes. Okay, finally, let's wrap this up, right? Um, the Buddhist teaching and meditations he taught can help us uh, find true happiness. Whatever our spiritual background may be, the Buddha and most of his followers today are not interested in converting people to their religion, but rather in offering all the ways they can help humankind grow in happiness and well-being and so bring about in the world those qualities Jesus laid out in the Beatitudes. It's a good word.